Okay. Now, Lord willing, there we go. Lord willing, in the creek don't rise, this will work. Does that look okay, sweetie? Yes, okay, your thumbs up. So, um, all right, funny story before uh, before I begin with any uh, any other Bible study thing. So, for the longest time, I was uh, I had thought the only way I could do Facebook Live videos was holding uh, um, with holding the phone straight up. Well, lo and behold, there was a uh, I had uh, made an error there. I had started the video this way, and then I tried to turn the phone that way. Well, after you start the video, you can't turn it. But lo and behold, if I had gone and turned the phone like five seconds earlier before I hit the button, everything would have been all right. So, um, lo and behold, uh, someone said, oh yeah, you absolutely can do that. So I was like, all right, well, I'll just figure out how to do that. And I'm, and I'm, I'm not kidding on this. I'm, uh, I'm watching a YouTube video on how to do how to do the the Facebook Live in uh, on, on landscape, which that's that's landscape. And this is what the guy does. He said, "Look, if you want to if you want to shoot this in landscape, don't forget turn your phone sideways." And that's all you've got to do. And I was like, no, there, there is no way that is happening. But lo and behold, that was all I was doing wrong. So, um, <laughs> Lord willing too, I've got a little room this time. I can actually move from this pulpit. I have been stuck in behind the pulpit now for what seems like eons. Um, and uh, I'm going to move a little bit. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I'm hoping... That uh, that little story. Oh, okay. I'll give you. I'll give you the other little story. Um, Lillian had just shared uh, the story about how uh, her and her husband went up to uh, uh, Lynchburg to see uh, Jerry Falwell and uh, went up for one of those services because I mean, back in the day it was a big, big, big service. Um, I had a great, great uncle, uh, Erwin Edwards was his name, all the way back in. Um, in uh, Alamance, back in Burlington, and um, he told me about a time he went up to uh, to go see Jerry Falwell and go up to Thomas Road Baptist Church and all. And um, it was real funny because I knew a little bit of of the service because we had the history of the church, um, you know, just being at Liberty University. And he talked about going up there. They were having a homecoming, and they had a meal on the grounds afterwards. And what they did was they were uh, they were having Colonel Sanders come and give his testimony, and um, he talked about the service. He said after the grounds there was chicken for everyone because Colonel Sanders had a policy if he was going to go speak somewhere, um, you would uh, he would have to go and uh, you had to serve his chicken if you were if he was going to be somewhere. So they did that, and uh, but it was really interesting. Um, they had uh, they had prepared, and you know you want everything to go off really well. So they're having Colonel Sanders come in. So they actually had somebody come and, and kind of go and when he was giving his testimony at some different churches, and he came up to one church, and um, one guy had said, and one one guy that was listening heard him give his testimony. And it was funny the way he gave it. He said, you know, before I got saved, he said I used to cuss and curse all the time. After I got saved, I didn't curse near as much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I remember that. I remember them telling that in, in, uh, at school. But um, that was that always brings that back at memory because he went to the uh, homecoming celebration they had and uh, he remembered the chicken and I remembered that story. So, Well, tonight uh, we're going to begin with our, uh, our prayer requests. Um, many of y'all got the uh, the column all already um, for Tom Whitfield. Um, this is our secretary's father. This is Stephanie's dad, um, Tom. He ended up uh, at home. He had two uh, strokes last night. Rushed him to uh, UNC Hospital. Um, they had you know done this, the scans and confirmed everything. 
uh, got him on meds and, and in talking, uh, she was able to talk to him this morning. He was, uh, he was doing real well. Um, and in fact, um, the last I had heard they were, he was going to go home. Uh, we had thought he was going to stay in the hospital a couple of days, but, um, is going to be at home. So I would ask that you would pray for Tom, but also you pray for Stephanie and her mom as they're watching out over him. They don't want, uh, want this to happen again and, and they want everything to be well so uh, please pray for healing there um, also uh, Allison and I got a prayer request this afternoon um, from uh, one of the moms at Grace's school she said please remember my family they are in Louisiana and uh, they're basically in the pathway of the storm that's coming in um, so we do need to lift up um, uh, just lift up Kim's family uh, in your prayers and uh, also, if you will, just uh, lift up those that are in the pathway of the storm. We've got a lot of, uh, a lot of people preparing and it seems to be a very large storm that will be coming. So uh, let's lift up all of Louisiana, Texas and those that are in the path. I um, also have some family down there. Yeah. Allison's got family, uh, aunt and uncle and cousins down down there. They're a little bit further north, praise the Lord. Um, so they they will not feel as bad of a, a hit, but um, I know all of Louisiana is preparing right now for it. Um, and amazingly, I, I don't know if y'all heard the, the uh, weather report, but we're going to get a little bit of it on like Saturday. So I thought, boy, that is a weird path for a hurricane to take. It's going to hit that way. It's just going to curve all the way back around. But you know, we're in 2020. It wouldn't surprise me if the thing just did a loop to loop or something. Tonight, who else can we remember in our prayers? Oh, it's given up. Yes. So let's remember it's uh, Debbie uh, Stavely, Stavely, Stavely uh -huh. um, in, in her passing. Remember her family, um, and also Alan Morris in, in hospice. Uh, pray the Lord would give grace there and help to the families. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, the family of Angie Brown. She's a second cousin of ours who passed this week. So remember the family of Angie Brown and her passing. It's Donna's second cousin. Pray for the family there. Let's continue to remember our country uh, with the election, with the unrest that is happening in many places within our nation. Uh, pray the Lord would give, give peace and help uh, during this hour of need. Uh, let's also remember all of those that um, are still battling COVID. Pray the Lord would help, and um, I, I'm praying that we would soon have a vaccine. We would soon have a lot of things that um, would help us. Um, so let's remember all of these things going on. Anyone else this week? Let's remember. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, remembering these that have been made known to us, as well as those that are on our hearts. Father God, Lord, as we come before you right now, we want to give you thanks for the opportunity and the chance to come together um, to, to study your word and to gain knowledge and wisdom from it. But Lord, also for this opportunity to come into your presence, that you are holy and mighty, and Lord, you are the giver of grace. And we pray and uh, lift up these requests into your hands right now for the many that are mourning the loss of loved ones, we ask for comfort. 
For these that are sick and upon the beds of affliction, we, we pray for healing. And Lord, for our nation, as we are going through so many difficulties now with the pandemic, with the election, with the unrest that we are having, Lord, we pray that you help to give us hope. Lord, we know that peace is possible. And Lord, we know that it occurred when you rule in the hearts of your people. And I pray that you would help, help us as a nation to go the right direction, to look at our, our neighbors and love them as ourselves. And Lord, I pray that your spirit would help bring peace to our nation. Lord, guide and direct us. Help us tonight as we again go into your work. Help us to go in and, and not be the same. Help us to experience real and lasting change. For it's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Well, if you uh, have your Bibles, uh, go ahead and be turning to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. I want to take this opportunity to welcome all of those that are tuning in uh, on Facebook Live. We're so glad that you are here with us. And we do hope the Lord blesses you as we have our Bible study. Our lesson tonight is called Through the Storm with Jesus. And our text is Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. The Word of God says this, On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boats, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and sea obey him? And God bless the reading of his word. Uh, we, we've had a lot of talk about hurricanes as of uh, uh, the last couple of weeks. We have gone through a lot of names. In fact, I've heard that uh, after, uh, once we get to end, we're going to have a hurricane nana. And I'm like, oh my goodness gracious, we're going to have a hurricane nana. That could mean trouble for us. Um, we're probably going to hear a lot more, but how many of y'all remember when Hurricane Katrina hit? Yeah, I remember. I mean, Hurricane, it was big news. Um, it, it did a lot of damage. And, um, you know, after it had hit, uh, Louisiana was, was tore up. New Orleans and, and all, of, all of that area. It, and it had so much rain and so much destruction. And there was a lot of blame that was going on at that time. Uh, the mayor was blamed, uh, then the director of FEMA was blamed, then the governor of the state was blamed, and then the people who refused to evacuate were blamed, and then the, the, the president was blamed. But you know, when, when we look at it, the thing that was to blame was the storm. The storm, when it's that size and hits, no amount of human intervention could have prevented everything bad that had happened. Yes, there could have been a little bit different preparation. But you know, there's always going to be enormous losses with storms that size. The thing I want to look at this evening is that in life, storms will come and things will always happen in our life. Storms came into the life of Jesus. One came here in Mark chapter 4. When he's out on the Sea of Galilee, these ferocious storms were something that was rather common. Uh, the Sea of Galilee was in a weird spot. You had a mountain. It was surrounded by mountains. And uh, 
you had you had these like ice covered snow capped mountains on one side and cold air would come in and then hot air would also come in and you would have these storms basically come out of nowhere and you know this area was a little bit like north carolina we've got uh, we got all these mountains on one side of us, we have the ocean on the other side of us, and we don't know a lot of times what all is going to be happening inside of us because there are so many unknown factors. Well, in the Sea of Galilee, these type of events can just come up. And Jesus is in, and his friends are in the middle of the lake when the storm hits. The disciples were terrified that they would not survive the storm. But what happens next are lessons that we can learn from. That's what I want to look at. Four lessons about the storms that come in our lives. Four lessons. Number one is this. The first is storms will come. Storms will come. Will come. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12 says this, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. You know, one of the things we have to remember is that in this life, bad things, storms, are going to pop up. It, it amazes me that sometimes people are just shocked when something bad happens. You know, we're learning a little bit about this when we're going through the book of Galatians. A lot of times people will say, well, wait a minute here. I, I, I followed God. I'm doing all the stuff that God wants me to do. Why does this bad thing happen? The disciples, they were as close to Jesus as they could physically be. And yet this storm happened. They're crying out, wait a minute. Hold on, we're going to perish. God, why are you letting this happen? There was this idea that they were close to Jesus, therefore everything was going to be okay. By the way, here's, here's the thing. When we go through life, we're, none of us are immune to it. That way of thinking, wait a minute here, why is this happening? This I, I followed God, I, God, I prayed, I, I've done all this. I, I've had a great grandmother, a grandmother, and a mother all battle cancer. Praise the Lord. All of them meet their, their battles with cancer. But you know what? It does raise some questions within a heart and a life when you hear it as a son, a grandson, or a great-grandson of going, wait a minute, hold on. These are good people, God. Why does this happen? And the reality is, is that storms have a purpose. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 15, we read about Abraham. In the promises that God made him. It says, and so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. It was interesting that, that word patiently. In the Greek, it can be translated long suffering. It would make it say, and so after long suffering, Abraham received what was promised. God made a great promise to Abraham, just as he makes great promises to his people. But so often, even within our own life, sometimes we have to go through that long suffering. Endurance and faith are the keys. And these are only possible because God is faithful to us. And one of the keys to understand all of this is that storms do come. There is no immunity to it. And by the way, that means something amazing for us to always keep in our minds. Regardless of where we are at in the next couple of days, if we're at, at school or at work or at the grocery store or we're just out and about somewhere, that means every person that you meet is in one of three stages of life. They're either going through a storm, which if they are, they need our prayers, they need our support, they need our help, they need our love, they need our encouragement. They're either going through a storm, they're coming out of a storm, or they're being prepared for their next storm. In any case, we all have to go and be that person that helps them along. You know, there's probably people today that you know that are going through a storm. 
It might be financial, it might be a health issue, it might be a relationship issue. But you know what? We might know somebody that feels like the whole boat is sinking. Crying out, Jesus, do you, do you even care if I drown? Are you aware of what I'm going through? It, it's interesting here. Mark chapter 4 uh, records this story of, of Jesus in the boat and calming the storm and all. But you know, it's also recorded in Matthew and Luke. But this is the only place where we have those words. Jesus, do you care that we are perishing? Don't you even care, Jesus? Some scholars speculate that when Matthew and, and Luke wrote their accounts, they knew full well that was in there, but they were like, oh, no, I, I don't know if I can write that down because that was something horrible to say. Matthew 8 and Luke 8 both, uh, both say, Lord, save us. They don't put these other words because the question was, how in the world can you say that to Jesus, but they did, and that was their true feelings. See, when we go through a storm, so often we think about, well, God didn't care about me, but it doesn't mean that at all. A, lot, a, a storm in our life doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. It doesn't mean that God is angry with you or that he's paying you back for something. God isn't toying with us. Sometimes when we go through these storms, God is reminding us of his faithfulness to us. Yes, some storms happen in our lives that are, that are self-made. You know, many times it's just for, because we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world. Jesus himself said God causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and send rain to the righteous and the unrighteous. The important thing is whether or not we are prepared for them. It's whether or not we are prepared for them. Now, in North Carolina, we have hurricanes. But you know what, what else we get? We get weather reports that say it might snow. I'm not going to say we get snow because that's rather rare, but we get weather reports that say it might snow. Now, what happens when we get a weather report that says, hey, it might snow? What do we do? Get that bread and milk. Bread and milk, because you need milk sandwiches. <laughs> bread and milk, what else? What else do you get? you got to get something to put in between the bread. Wait, I'll, I'll work that up. Well, what do you get? It used to, uh, several years ago, it was a favorite song of Phil's and mine. It's Keep Me Safe Through the Storm Passing By. There you go. We've got that in our hymnal. The, uh, it was a good song. Oh, yeah. Still is a good song. Huh? It still is a good song. But we, we go in and you've got milk and bread. Uh, uh, we prepare, right? We get ready. Um, you get some gas for your generator, you get a little bit more salt, you get some water, you get you get those things. You need to be praying for that storm that's going to hit down that coast where they told that how many people they want evacuated. Oh, yeah. How can they get all that many people away? Well, they do, they're going to do it. They're going to get them out. 500,000 maybe. In talking about the idea of a hurricane, there's a, there was a, a neat little news report. This is all the way back in Hurricane Andrew. There was a TV news camera crew that was on assignment in southern Florida filming the widespread destruction of Hurricane Andrew. The camera panned the whole area where amid the devastation and debris, one lone house was still standing on its foundation. The owner was cleaning up the yard when a reporter approached him and said, Sir, why is your house the only one still standing? How did you manage to escape the severe damage of the hurricane? He said, I built this house myself. And I also built it according to the Florida State Building Code. When the code called for two by six roof trusses, I used two by six roof trusses. I was told that a house built according to code could withstand a hurricane. I did, and it did. It could be no one else around here followed the code. This was 
to man that understood the idea of preparation, of preparing for the storm that was to come. It had nothing to do with him. It was about the area in which he lived and the nature of storms. His job was to prepare. You know what? We're all living life. And in life, we will have storms. You know, we've got to ask ourselves, how do we prepare? Let me give you these three things. I believe one of the great preparations of our life is have a great prayer life. Have one that you just know how to pray. Uh, back when I was in middle school, I guess I was a lot, a lot like a, a lot of middle school boys. Um, I, I don't know if Hunter's like this or not. Does he have a bicycle he just absolutely adores? I think, I think all boys right around that age, yeah. there's that, that little thing. You just love a bicycle. I would ride all over Elon. My mother would send me to Food Lion to go get canning lids and other things. And he said, here, here's money, go get it. And I would ride my bike one mile down the road, go to Food Lion and come on back. And it was like nothing. I wish I had that type of energy now. I probably could go to the end of the driveway and say, that's it, I'm walking back. I, I, could, I could ride. I would ride miles on the end with no problem. You know, if somebody wanted me to do something on my bicycle, no big deal. Prayer life is like that. If we have that vibrant, strong prayer life, constantly going and getting close to God, when the storm comes, it's nothing. We could go run into God's presence. Now, another thing we can do is have a close and good Bible knowledge. You know, I'm amazed. Uh, when we were at camp, one of the things that we're focusing on was hiding God's Word in our heart, memorizing Bible verses, just to have them so that in times of trouble, in times of difficulty, in times of temptation, we can go up and just bring them back to memory. Say, oh, you know what, I'm being tempted. But you know what, First Thess or, excuse me, 1 Corinthians um, 10, 13 says, No temptation has taken you except which is common to man, but God is faithful, and he will make a way along with the temptation of escape that we may be able to endure it. The idea is we can bring those things to mind in storms. But you know all, what else we need to have is a following and trusting life. That we would follow and trust Jesus. Because you know what, if we have that already in our life, if we can follow God in the easy times, it's that much easier in the hard. So we know this. Number one, storms will come. You know, the second lesson of this story is this. Jesus is with us in the storm. Jesus is with us in the storm. If you're going to go through a storm, the one person you want in the boat is Jesus. Jesus could have stayed on the shore and let them take all the chances themselves. Jesus was exhausted from a long, long day of ministry, but he knew that. He said, you know what? I'm going to go with you. See, the problem for the disciples was that he was with, him, with them, but he was asleep. And he was asleep because, like I said, total exhaustion, but also total peace. Interestingly to notice, this is the only incident in Scripture where it says that Jesus actually slept. A lot of times you talk about Jesus staying up all night, but we knew he had to sleep. But they interpreted this sleep as a lack of care. They interpreted it saying, hey, he's asleep, he must not care. And it's ironic because, you know, how many of y'all, when, when you get a big old thunderstorm and the, the, uh, the wind is blowing and the walls are, are shaking? I know uh, Grace was uh, doing homework uh, we were with a friend, and, and the, the walls shook. Y'all didn't want to go to sleep then, did you? It was like walls shaking. All right, let's go take a nap. We don't usually do that, right? But here it was. Jesus was asleep. We've all been there at some point in time. We're in the middle of a crisis and it seems like God is off somewhere taking a nap. 
He doesn't seem very, very responsive, but the reality is he knows exactly what is going on. See, look at what Jesus' response was when he was waking. He gets up, he rebukes the storm, the storm's gone. And he asks the two questions. Why are you so afraid? And do you still have no faith? Fear and faith are incompatible. You might expect that Jesus would be compassionate here. Why are you so afraid? The disciples said, well, you might say, you know what, wait a minute here. You know, we have water coming in the boat, thunder, lightning, waves. What Jesus was hoping for was remembering all the things that he did in the past. And all the stuff that he would do in the past would bring a stronger faith in the future. See, Jesus first had to calm the storm, then he had to calm his disciples. You know, when we think about it, we got to ask ourselves a question, has God ever done anything for us? Well, we can, we can name it, right? We have a Thanksgiving service, and we're able to give testimony, and we can come up and we give you know, testimonies about him saving our souls, but also of, of helping us through cancer, of helping us through the struggles of someone dying and, and, and going through a, a difficult time, of finding a job, of doing some great and marvelous works in our life. We're able to we're able to tell those things. You know, in the Old Testament, as you read it, there's a lot of places where God says, hey, erect this stone altar here. Or, hey, set up a pillar here. Or, hey, take these stones and arrange them here. And why does God say do those things? Why, did he, why, why are all these pillars and everything in the Old Testament? So what, what does God say those things were for? To remember what he had done for them. There you go. Hey, hey. Children of Israel, y'all going to go through the, uh, through the river here. Go get some big stones and put them on the other side. What in the world for? So that you can remember what I did in the past. You know, I, I think about it, we need to do that in our own life. Jesus had done plenty of miracles. Jesus had done plenty of things that the disciples could have remembered. You know what? We, we've, got a, we've got a great thing to remind us. We have phones now, don't we? We have like umpteen different ways to remember things, but you know what? I think it would be great. Take your phone and take a picture. Hey, this day, on this day, God answered this prayer. Put it out on Facebook, put it out, or just give it to yourself as a reminder. Print it out and say, hey, look, this is an answer to prayer. Why? So that we can look at the plat the past, so that we can have greater faith. In the future, Jesus is with us in the storm. But notice also this number three Jesus will calm the storm. Jesus will calm the storm. I want you to make sure you understand the, the most important word of that point. It's the first one Jesus. That is probably the hardest lesson to learn. I don't know, how many of y'all can make it stop raining? Right? No. Yeah. Um, I was uh, I was driving with my grandparents, and um, we were coming back, I think, from the mountains at some point in time, and it was raining. And I was probably seven, eight years old. I was in the back of uh, their Lincoln Town car, which of course, the back of a Lincoln Town car is about the size of a half of a stadium, a football, a football stadium. I mean, it was magnificent. And it was raining. And you could just hear the rain. It was just coming on down. You know, but it was, it was great. And I thought, you know what? God, can you just make it stop raining right now? And I didn't look at it, and I, it just kind of threw me off. But I remember doing this. I was like, just make it stop. Just make all the rain just stop. All the raindrops give up. Give a thing. At that moment, we went under a bridge. 
<laughs> now all of a sudden I didn't hear anything. I'm like, oh my goodness gracious. But I mean, you think about it, I can't make it stop raining. I, and there's, there's no chance. That's let alone a storm. Let us remember that it is God who is able to stop things. So we don't need to expend our energy doing things we have no ability to do. At the perfect time, during the perfect storm, he exercises his perfect power over this storm in Galilee. And so he does in our own life. God is never in a hurry. And the reason he is, he's, uh, because he knows exactly what to do at exactly the right time. Amen. You know, one of the points I made, it's one of, one of the very first points I ever made in a sermon. So this thing is like really, really old. I, I made the point that God's clock isn't digital. What I meant by it is that God doesn't work on our time frame. He works on him. He knows and understands you and the situation and his timing is perfect. Romans 5 and verse 6, you see at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. He's always watching out for us. Peter wrote, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayers. Think about this. How crazy would it be to try and stop snow from falling? I can give you a basic, best case scenario that you are in one of those little light flurries, but those flurries that have like big old massive uh, snowflakes. You can stop like one or two of them, right? Get your hands out. But how many others are coming down every single second? You know, the only thing you would do in trying to stop the snow is wear yourself out. Make yourself tired to no end. You know, if we want the snow, if we want the storm to go, we have to wait until the sun comes out. You know, the same is true in our own lives. If we want the storm to go, we must wait for the sun, S-O-N, to come out. Finally, this will, will be done. The fourth lesson is, it is only in the storm that we truly understand who Jesus actually is. It's only in the storm that we truly understand who Jesus is. Here's the, uh, the amazing part of all of this. It's the disciples' reaction to Jesus. When Jesus asks them why they are afraid, it, it's the Greek word meaning fearful in a, in a moderate sense. Oh, I'm a little, I'm a little scared. Oh, the, the thunder re uh, rolled a little bit and the, the lightning struck a little bit. Now, oh, oh, I'm a little, I'm a little scared. But when Jesus calms the storm, the Bible said they were terrified and asked each other, "Who is this? Even the winds and waves obey him." The Greek there literally says they feared with great fear. They just thought they, uh, they were afraid before, but they were terrified of Jesus. The fear of the storm was nothing compared to the power and the might shown by Jesus Christ. It's one thing to be in the boat with someone you believe was sent from God to be a great teacher and spiritual leader. It's quite another thing to be confined in a small space with one whom you suddenly realize is the Lord of all of the universe. Your knees give way and begin to tremble, and you find it difficult to breathe. You know, it's interesting. It's the second time Jesus rebuked something in, in Mark's gospel. The first time was in Mark chapter 1 when he rebukes an unclean spirit, a demon. 
Jesus said, certainly come out of him is, is the idea of what his re rebuke is. And the response is very similar. What is this? He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. Throughout Mark's Gospels, the disciples as well as others keep coming to new understandings of who Jesus is. And it's always in the context of a crisis. Here's the idea. The crisis that we go through, the storms that come our way, those are opportunities that God says, look, I'm going to show you how big I actually am. I'm going to show you what kind of power I have in this life, and it is going to blow your mind. The Apostle Peter says this, Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials, these have come that, uh, so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. When we think about the very difficult things that people went through in the Bible, the individuals that were blind, they went through a very horrible and really gut-wrenching time. But what an amazing thing when Jesus healed them. The affliction of the lame man, horrible, terrible to go through, Jesus came and showed the might that he had when he said, come and walk. Sin had ruined Mary until Jesus delivered her and she was able to understand who she was. Thomas was devastated by the events of when he doubted. But oh, how Christ exalted him and brought him up and energized him by saying, come and feel the place in my side. What did he do? He cried out, my Lord and my God. Think about this. All the way back in March, the pandemic hit. Our doors were shut and life as we knew it changed. We have craziness going on politically. We have restlessness. We have a lot of things going on in our nation. The storm is raging just now. But you know what I'm confident of? The sun's going to come out. There will be words spoken. And there will be great fear. The good fear of God that comes forth from it. In his book, The Unnecessary Pastor, Eugene Peterson writes this. I'm going to end with this. My two sons are both rock climbers. And I have listened to them plan their ascents up mountains. They spend as much or more time planning their climbs as in the actual climbing. They meticulously plot their route, and then as they climb, they put what are called protection pitons hammered into small crevices in the rock face with attached ropes that will arrest a quick descent to death. Rock climbers who fail to put in protection have short climbing careers. Our pitons, or protection, Come as we remember and hold on to those times when we have experienced God's faithfulness in our lives. Every answered prayer, every victory, every storm that has been calmed by his presence is a piton which keeps us from falling, losing hope, or worse yet, losing our faith. Every piton in our life is an example of God's faithfulness to us. As we ascend in the kingdom of God, we also realize that each experience, each victory, is only a piton, a stepping stone towards our ultimate goal of finishing the race in receiving the crown of glory. 
We think about that. As we go through a storm, let us not forget the faithfulness of God, but also let us not forget the power of God. That I believe even as we have this crazy storm going on in our life, there's going to be a plan time the sun comes out and great and amazing things happen. As we close tonight, are there any comments, any observations? Let's bow in a word of prayer as we close. Father, Thank you so much for your faithfulness towards us. Thank you for the, your word and the lessons that guide and direct us. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to take these lessons that we have here tonight. And Lord, I pray that you would, you would place them in our hearts. And that you would help us. Help us to remember the times that you have guided and directed us. Those pitons that, would, that will help us as we ascend towards you. Father, I pray that you would help to have uh, help to give us confidence. For Lord, we know the boat is rocking right now, but Lord, we know that there's a point to it. That you are soon going to be out and the sun will rise. Father, help us to have patience and hope. Help us to trust in you. Please dismiss us now with your blessings. For it's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. To everyone on Facebook that has been watching, thank you so much for tuning into our service tonight. We do hope that the Lord blesses you this evening. And uh, to everybody else, thank y'all so much for being here tonight. We do hope the Lord blesses y'all as y'all go back home and uh, drive very safely.